uh, these are things that sort of explode out of the blue and, and take us completely off balance and have our off the scale. So first and foremost, John, I really would like to reiterate how kind it is for you to invite me into your home to ha have a chat with me where basically two or three weeks ago I was a complete stranger. And only through reading your book, which my son bought me for Father's Day, and I think within a few pages I kind of thought, I'm going to look this chap up on LinkedIn, and there you were. And then, incredibly, you, you, you connected with me, and then we've had a few conversations since, and uh, here we are now about to talk about this. And, and it is a wonderful book. Um, I'm not saying that because you're just sat there. I think for me, having put all of these notes in, I rarely do that in a book. Mm. Um, it's inspired me to go and talk and l about lots of other things, um, find out about other people. And I think that's one Good. of the, the traits of this book, the generosity you have in referencing lots of other people. This isn't a book all about you. You know, you have an amazing story to tell and I hope to tell a little bit about that. But, you know, I, I think you're, you're, you know, you're, your flavour of the book is about helping people go and find points of reference, yeah. um, and I think that's good. But one question I would like to start with, if I may, is it was written pre-COVID, so yeah. it came out last year. How different would this book be if you were writing it or finishing it off now, John? I don't think it would be massively different, uh, Roger. I think what would be different would be that there would be at least one more case study in there. Because <laughs> in a way, what I've done yeah. is to look at the sort of problems that we now collectively face. And some people describe them as wicked or super wicked problems. You know, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talked about black swans. Uh, these are things that sort of explode out of the blue and, and take us completely off balance and have an off the scale impact. And in the book, I do talk about things like uh, plastics in the ocean. I mean, no one really set out to um, fill the oceans with uh, plastic waste, uh, but that's where we've got to. It talks about antibiotic resistance, you know, miracle products. No one really uh, set out to undermine their efficacy, mm. but that's exactly what we've been doing. It talks about obesity, chronic disease, uh, diabetes, all of these, um, in a way, uh, malfunctions of luxury lifestyles or, or, or of modern lifestyles. Um, it talks about space debris. I mean, we've just heard that the um, Russians are uh, uh, testing a weapon to shoot down satellites. Some countries like China have already done it. I was in China when they did the first one of those. 3,000 clods of debris suddenly go into orbit around the, the, the Earth. And you know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and people like that really keen to get to Mars and, and good luck to them, China as well. Hmm. Um, and yet it's entirely conceivable that the time will come when we simply can't get off the planet because the amount of debris uh, going uh, we'll be trapped. around. Well, at least for all intents and purposes, unless people are prepared to accept fairly major risk. And that's even before we get to the climate emergency. Mm. So all of these um, challenges have very similar characteristics. They are, they're systemic and COVID-19 is systemic in the sense that it links wildlife trafficking, you know, people digging out guano in bat caves, um, uh, modern societies, but with still traditional things like wet markets uh, bubbling uh, away, and, and then the sort of interconnectivity mm. of the planet, you know, airlines and subways and mass transit systems and so on. So to me, it's very much in the spirit, uh, the rather malign spirit of problems of that I was already uh, talking about, but by God, it's advanced things. It's suddenly accelerated many things that have been bubbling under and just Finally, I think one of the things that really is, I found really striking, stuff that would have seemed absolutely outlandish and impossible a year, 18 months ago, suddenly seems not only possible, but almost inevitable. It's one of those gradually yes. then suddenly moments. You yeah, gradually then suddenly. Well, funnily enough, um, when I read that, and it's from that Hemingway character yeah. in the book, you, re you referenced that, um, it also reminded me of a German economist called Rudiger, Rudiger Dornbusch, mm. um, who said things tend to happen slower than you imagined that they would, yeah. then they happen faster than you thought they could. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's very much that flavour which, you know, put that through the lens of climate change. And I think that article today, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, about the mass migration of people that's already yeah. underway. New York Times, we talk about, yes, yeah, yeah, we talk about climate change almost as though it's a future uh, event. It yeah. isn't. Yeah. It's now. 
it's yeah. actually happening it's with us you know it's visiting upon humanity absolute mayhem right now not it Parts might do humanity, but yeah not all of us yet but sure yeah, but yeah. we don't see it do we yeah. because we are you know you and I live in you know a nice affluent country rel yeah. relatively speaking yeah um, but in you know southern South America um, certainly in parts of you know sub-saharan Africa even yeah. Asia um, well take Jakarta you reference Jakarta in the yeah. book I, I recall um, and that the solution to that, and I think you maybe put that word in inverted commas, was to simply up sticks and move Jakarta to, to Borneo or somewhere. I mean, it would be easier to say that Jakarta is being moved simply because the, the seas are rising because of climate change. That's one big factor. But they've also pumped the aquifers under the city to such an extent. It's a bit like Mexico City. <laughs> the whole city is sinking. So you've got this combination thing of city going down, seas coming up, boom. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but to me, I, in a way, I think we are all in danger now of living in Jakarta in one way or another. Yeah, it. it, it uh, I felt felt that as I, I read the book. Um, but like I say, I, I I rarely read a book and put lots of little stickies in it. And it wasn't simply because I was you know coming to it see you. It's very pretty. Well, it does, doesn't it? I, I, maybe that's something for publishers it's to like consider. Like a tro tropical fish or some <laughs> description. It yeah. does a bit. Um, but one of the things that caught my attention, which I know my audience on LinkedIn would, would love to hear a bit more about, was your encounter with Ford. Now, mm. I appreciate if you're working with people um, in a business capacity, there are certain things, of course, you can't reference and, and can't yeah. talk about. Um, but given that you were with Bill Ford, um, who's, you know, was it grandfather or great grandfather? Great grandfather uh, invented the um, uh, production line for yes. for mass yeah. pr production of uh, combustion engine cars. Um, what did you come away from that experience that you can share with us about? Because we're on this epic transition now to electrification in the automotive world, yeah. and it's very troubling and it's very difficult both for certainly for incumbents and for startups, yeah. other than maybe Tesla. It's, you know, it's a challenging journey. So what, what did you come away from the Bill Ford experience well, with? A, a bit of context first, then I'll answer the Bill Ford question. I, I've worked 40 years with business, but I started out as an environmentalist. Uh, and therefore, it's always been absolutely critical to me that where we're working with business, any business, that we are really open about who we're working with, what we're doing for them, under what terms. Um, I once did a, a, a session for Hard Talk uh, on television when we were working with Shell, and almost the first question I was asked was, how much is Shell paying you? Mm. And I just gave the, 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 the precise number, which is what the interviewer uh, expected. And I do this not because I'm uh, wildly transparent, but because I feel that we are, whether however many times we say we are not representing the world or the future or anything mm. else, People see us that way. Mm. Um, so I want to say to, to the wider world, this is what we're doing to some degree perceived to be on your behalf, even if we're not pitching it that way. Uh, Ford came to us, um, and Bill Ford in particular, um, uh, and right at the beginning of uh, this century. And uh, he knew, in fact, his second question to me, he knew we'd publicly resigned a, a contract recently with Monsanto. The CEO at Monsanto, Bob Shapiro, had invited us uh, in to help them think through how to deal with genetic engineering and, 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 and um, uh, GM foods, particularly in the European sector, but, but um, globally. And we just found that they had a tin ear. I mean, they just they couldn't hear what we were saying. And quite a number of years later, I, I talked to Bob about why that was. His answer was very simple. We had Wall Street multiples that were, meant that we couldn't afford to listen to you. But y yes, we um, uh, lost Europe for GM mm. foods for a while. And actually, in the end, they lost Monsanto, was sold mm. to buy us. So um, we're very open. And with Bill, he knew we'd done that. And his, first, his second question to me was, if you had a relationship with Ford, what would it take you to want to resign it or get to the point where you'd want to resign it? So this wasn't simply a commercial contractual relationship. It, it, it had some sort of political dimension. And then to your question, you know, I, 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 I liked him tremendously. I think he's, he's an extraordinarily um, uh, interesting and intelligent man. I think at times he risked being overshadowed just by the sheer family legacy and the rest mm -hmm. of it. But I think he's made a very good sense of it over time. And one of the early things he said to me was, and I remember this is, this is sort of um, 15, 20 years ago, 
Um, he was worried as a family member uh, of the Ford family that the time would come, uh, and he said it'll be in 20 or 30 years, when the uh, court cases, uh, you know, the class actions and so on, would start to stack up against Detroit and the automotive industry, but Ford, uh, in his, his case in particular, and that that would be uh, very much like the tobacco uh, yeah. issue. And asbestos probably as well. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. people would say, you knew this stuff. You knew what yeah. was coming out of your uh, tailpipes. You knew about not just climate change, but you know, childhood asthma and the rest of it. And he said, I don't want that to happen. Well, it started mm. to happen about three years later when mm. California, the state of California, uh, took forward to court um, for precisely those sorts of issues. So he, uh, very unusually, and I think it's partly the family context, which just partly who he is. I, I think he's sort of an environmentalist as well. He, he could see that stuff. He knew it was over the horizon. He didn't want to run headlong into it. So I, I, um, I enjoyed working with him. Right, good, good. Well, here's another thing. Um, there was an interview that, with Carl Sagan, I think it was Charlie mm. Rose, master of asking the succinct, brilliant question. Um, it's in the book. Uh, Carl Sagan 19, answering. 96, that. yeah. I'm going to ask you the same question, actually, actually, John. What it was. Who is making the decisions about science and technology that are going to determine the type of future our children are going to live in? I thought, what, an, what a glorious reference for you to make in that. Carl Sagan is absolutely one of my heroes, and I'm sure many people watching this on, on LinkedIn, an yeah. astonishing human being. So there you are. It's not Carl's question, it's yours. <laughs> It's funny, a few years back, my wife Elena and I were in Barcelona, went out to the aquarium, and suddenly I heard those wonderful soft tones of Carl Sagan's voice. I mean, many years after he died, obviously, but it was you know, one of his television series. And I think people like him and David Attenborough and Brian Cox and so on do an immense service in making science and to some degree technology accessible to the ordinary mm. um, citizen. And I think that's desperately needed because the facile answer would be to say, who's going to influence the way we pay attention to science? It's going to be idiots like Donald Trump. Well, I don't think it is. I think, uh, I think he's tried to push back on science. I think Boris Johnson, to some degree, has been doing it as well. All the populists uh, are playing mm. that same game. If they choose to disbelieve it, they think the problems will go away. I, yeah. I, I don't think that's true, um, of course. So I think the people who are going to shape uh, science uh, in, in the most profound way are the people beavering away on the edges of science, people people we've currently not heard of, the Max Planck's of the day, the Albert Einstein's of the day, you know, just they're, they're people who sort of lurking, not in patent offices perhaps now, but <laughs> no, they're, they're, and they're not now doing the really big ticket uh, uh, astrophysics work, some of them may well be, but yeah. they're starting to play into synthetic biology and there's this whole spectrum you look at uh, digital digitalization and how that's now in, uh, influencing every technology that's coming through but then so is biology and so over time will ecology uh, come to do that so it, when i think about where science is 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 taking its biggest leaps forward i suspect it's going to be in places that aren't in direct line of view for us that they, they are on the edges and some of that could even be in sort of people's garages and you know sort of um, biohackers and people like that. Who mm. knows? Um, but some of it, as you, you, your work covers, you know, this whole sort of electrification surge in, in, in vehicles and everything else, smart grids and autonomous, this, that, and the other, AI. Um, you know, most of the public, if it knows about that stuff at all, either thinks robots are going to take our jobs or won't it be exciting to have a test if ever I, only I could afford it. <laughs> but actually thinking beyond that is... Beyond I'm in that last group, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, but it, 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 I, 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 one quick thing is that you know, I went to university first time around the late 60s. I did economics. I gave it up, at, up, gave it up after one year because it just seemed mm. to have very little to do with the wider world. But one thing that stuck with me from that study of economics uh, were was two uh, economists, both of whom were loathed by, by economics professors. Nikolai Kondratiev, Joseph Schumpeter, both said the same thing. Economies don't go in straight lines, they go in sort of pretty yeah. wild uh, ways cycles, or cycles. Yeah. And here we are again, I think we're in one of these periods where an old order, geopolitical, macroeconomic, technology driven, is unraveling all around us. And we think it's going to do a V or a U or possibly a W or 
at the worst an L-shaped um, sort of uh, response or recovery in some cases. I think it's 12 to 15 years if we're lucky. Uh, and all sorts of stuff is already happening. It's not just simply, this is a disaster, we've got to hunker down in our bunkers for 12 to 15 years. It's we've got to get behind that new order as it starts to build. And we've got to really also address the needs and concerns of the people who are going to be dispossessed as they're shaken out of that oh, old order. Uh, absolutely, which possibly sets up this, this next thought or, or question. Um, the two frames of reference in terms of what the future might be yeah. um, and, and I got a very sim fair, relatively simplistic view of it because I didn't go to university I didn't study anything to a great degree mm. um, I've just sort of ho hobbled along a bit um, but the two things are cornucopian yeah. um, uh, and um, Malthusian yeah. so cornucopian is comes from cornucopia horn of plenty yeah. that humanity has got the ability to invent itself out of yeah. you know trouble um, or, or Malthus, Malthusian, which would be that we just breed ourselves into a position where there are so many human beings do many, doing so many things that even he didn't understand back in the day, yeah. but to a point at which we obliterate ourselves. Now, we'll Obliterate the natural world. Yeah. Well, well, indeed, exactly. So, so between being Malthusian or, Malthusian or Cornucopian, are you a hybrid of those two, John, or are you one or the other? Uh, I'm a hybrid of everything. And, and in a way, you know, <laughs> when I went back to university, I did do city planning. And when I came to the, one of the very first lecturers, I remember one professor saying to me, I'll bet some of you have come to this class thinking that cities are cancers. It was true of me. I, I believe cities were like tumours. And I've come over time to realise that they have those characteristics. But at the same time, uh, they may well be the saving of us, that, that um, as we cluster as a species, as we become into cities, as we become an urban species, our uh, total footprint could go down quite significantly. We won't all need to be driving around on electric tractors or whatever. We can uh, use subways and public transport yeah. systems and so on. So I'm a hybrid. I, 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 and I oscillate. Sometimes I just look at the news and I think, this is a Malthusian world, there's no question yeah. about it. But at the same time, I also believe that our species does its best work when it's backed into a corner, and here we are. Indeed we are. Well, on that point of being backed into a corner, the kind of fight and flight moment, yeah. um, one thing, that, again, that, that thread, threads through the book, and I know I've heard you talk about this elsewhere, is the importance and the influence of, of, of women yeah. in, in global society. Obviously, it's a huge variation around different cultures, religions, all, all sorts of things. But let's be frank, you know, man to man, the reality of, of the history of the world has been overly dominated by male thinking, yeah, masculine reason, thought. But yes. um, can we change that? Because, you know, normally you hear women talking about feminism, women talking about, you know, uh, yeah. more equality, etc. But, but... I think you and I are probably on a similar page in that we need to see much, much more influence yeah. from women. How can that happen? How can we, given all these different cultures around the world, etc., how can, what can trigger that change, John? The, the simplest answer is, I don't know. I don't have a button that I think we can <laughs> all press and it'll all change overnight. And I've worked in country, countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and I've seen, you know, this is its harshest in some degrees, uh, most extreme. Most of the organizations I founded, and I founded, co-founded four since 1978, have largely been women. And it's partly because uh, they're attracted to this, what we now call the sustainability uh, world. They, they, they sense its importance. Um, but I also look at the work that people like Paul Hawken has done with his project Trodan uh, book and now platform. And, and when he looked at the, and, and with really detailed mathematical modeling, at the solutions for climate change mm. that really are likely to have a major impact, the empowerment uh, and education of girls and education were well in, uh, the, there were two entries within the top uh, 10. Uh, so. It, it's not just people saying, it, wouldn't it be nice, uh, to quote the Beach Boys. It's, it, it, <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely something we have to deal as a part of a systemic uh, challenge and in many ways a systemic uh, crisis. And if you are older and if you are white and if you're all these other things, um, you know, that's quite challenging when you start to have to think, so I'm going to have to give up my 
mm. uh, role, my space, my hard fought for whatever, uh, to a different species, and um, and that's why some people possibly mm. even think about it. Um, but but I think we've got to work through that. Um, and um, so just finally, I think um, it's got to be a combination. It it can't simply be uh, one gender saying over to you. Because that's like the older people saying to the younger people, we tried, we were environmentalists, we drove our Teslas or whatever over to you, because that's a recipe for absolute screaming disaster. And I think it, 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 it's got to be an opening up, but it's got to be consistent, sustained uh, preparation and pushing mm. from, from and on behalf of women to make this happen. Good. I, I take that as very positive um, thinking to it. And, and, and the other thread through the book it, it is this point about imagine the unimaginable you know yeah. think the unthinkable don't just believe that because this is the way it is and always has been it can't change yeah. and I think the energy that young people inevitably have the passion sometimes naivety which can yeah. be very very useful yeah. um, we are seeing signs of that coming through I think if you look a lot of the people working in around the stuff that I get involved in um, autonomous and electric and yeah. shared and connected cars all of that are people who actually believe that we can have a world where you don't own a car anymore. Because owning a car is lunacy. It is. Um, I have a, a very strong and passionate belief, which seems a little bit incongruous given the world that I work in, that, that mass adoption of electric vehicles must never happen. It would be foolish to just swap the combustion engine lump of metal yeah. for a billion uh, electric vehicle um, propositions. But, but perhaps mass adoption of electric buses Taxes, yeah. that's, doing very well. that's yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, which is a nice link actually into you. You, you mentioned um, the biggest and most influential a and country that's changed more than any other on the planet, certainly in the last 30 years China. Yeah, where are we with China? Because it's almost like Dickens, a tale of two <laughs> cities, it's a tale of two countries, a visionary leadership that understands the huge issues of the yeah. day. Uh, trying to tackle, you know, 1.4 billion population and feed them and look after them, sustain them. But at the same time, a number of other things which, you know, and we can go through a list, but perhaps let's yeah. not do that, but they are reprehensible things. So how do you reconcile what China is? Well, again, uh, you mentioned uh, how do you think the unthinkable? And with China, I think we've struggled to think the unthinkable about where that... Um, the emergence of that nation might uh, take us. And, 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 and firstly, to the how do you think the unthinkable, one of the things I've done over the years is both to read a lot of science fiction and to seek out science fiction authors and just talk to them because you know they, they tend to be really interesting people. And recently I started to read more in English translation Chinese science fiction because I think it wow, John, I didn't even know there was any. Oh, no, I'm it, really it, sorry. It's a but huge, wow. huge. Um, Industry almost is it? in China. That's and, fascinating. And, I mean, I, I can I can pull out a couple of books before you uh, go. But um, and what's because when you think about America and its rise to uh, global power, particularly after the Second World War, you had this explosion of science fiction because mm. people knew they were on an upward trajectory and they wanted to understand where that might take them. And that's where China is now. And 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 so you get a lot of fascinating. Um, uh, science fiction. I mean, most obviously the three-body problem, but 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 many other uh, uh, facets of that sort of almost reimagining. To your question, China, uh, where's that headed? Uh, I've worked in China not that often, but maybe seven or eight times over the years, and it's a country I love, and that frightens the wits out of me. I was there when they <laughs> shot down one of their satellites. I saw the deep nationalism and and mm. sense of grievance that goes back to. Know the Opium Wars when we imposed yep. all of that on them, and why not? I yeah. mean, I, I, I yeah, it's understandable, isn't it? It's deeply, deeply there. And and um, uh, when I was in China, uh, one of the ministers I talked to said, "Well, the thing about China is that we studied the rise of Prussia. We know what happens. We know the dynamics. We're not going to let that happen. Mm. And yet, ex that's exactly where we are now. And you mm. you have a madman in the White House, and he's not a madman, Xi, in in in, in, in Beijing. But what you have." as you have in um, uh, Ru Russia, where you have Putin as the new Tsar, you have the new emperor in, in, in Xi, who's just yeah. trying to uh, pull everything to him. And what do those sites, sorts of people do? And I include Trump among them. 
when they're in danger, they externalize the challenge. They focus on the yeah. other and the enemy. Yeah. We are much closer to war with China. Uh, and I, I include in that, you know, India, what's been happening on the frontiers mm. there, than I think anyone even begins to understand. And it won't be like the Second World War. It'll be a proxy war. It'll be, you know, um, things that are done initially remotely. It'll be drones or whatever doing stuff that are deniable, as, as America has been doing yeah. with... Uh, well, perhaps there are even things being done now, yeah. and we're not even aware of it. Uh, there will um, be, there will be. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think it's an extremely dangerous and an extremely frightening time. And we're in that tit, -tat, tit for tat, so we'll shut down our um, uh, you, you, your, your consulate or embassy here. And, 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 and then, yeah. uh, I don't think China wants to go that route, incidentally, but I just don't think she can uh, yeah. to lose space. Well, well I, I, again, and I, I, I don't want to be on a mantra of um, pro-women, anti-men, but, but again, look at it. This conflict, these countries, these leaders, the people yeah. you've just referenced, they are all men. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, that I or, or feminists denigrate men per se. It's that it, in having a, a very unbalanced power base yeah. around the world of world leaders that are just men or mostly men, um, I think this is this is where we get the kind and, of almost yeah, and you cabinets know, that are increasingly masculine uh, in a way, uh, yeah, you know, both genders included in that. But you no, know, and it's often been said in the last few weeks that you look at Jacinta Ardern in New Zealand, you look at Angela Merkel in Germany, you look at Taiwan, you look at different countries where people have dealt with the pandemic uh, intelligently. Yes, they tend largely to be women. Yeah, it, it sounds a bit more really, a coincidence, yes, doesn't it? it? I don't think it is. Yeah, no, I don't either. Um, so I, I, I don't either. But it, will that lead to a, a phase change where the, where the whole system goes female? I don't think so, because what I've, very often that's a late stage symptom of a cycle, where, and then you get into a war, and that tilts the whole thing back unfortunately to yeah. masculinity yeah it, it, it does now w one one thought that i really i kept trying to extract from the book and i kind of a bit like how you say you are from day to day i thought i i'd got it then i didn't i thought i got it then i didn't is what can i do about it yeah what can i take from this so you've been on a journey as an environmentalist an author a writer an investor lots of many you know many things for for decades what is it you've been doing or you now think you could do better or you would encourage other people to do to make yeah. a tangible difference? Well, in a way, if I can be personal, I mean, I, when I started, I was just seeing these great big black factories, I mean, in my brain mm. as much as in reality, and wanting to understand why people did that. Uh, you know, and, and so initially coming in from the outside, and I always say, you know, getting into the first few companies was... They didn't want you inside. They didn't want you anywhere near where things happened. So if you got through the main gate or into the front door, you were doing remarkably well. Mm. But you mainly only then met defensive people, PR people, lawyers, and so on. Now we're in boardrooms, C-suites. It's almost a matter of course. And over time, the the, the front on which we engage businesses and change has expanded enormously. So started out with companies and, and low down, went up to the top boards and C-suites. Uh, it went out to uh, supply chains, value webs, and so on. It, uh, we did a book in the late 80s called The Green Consumer Guide, sold a million copies in 18 months. And that was part of the um, awakening of consumers, at least for a while. It went out to the financial markets, people as investors, and so on. But now there's a growing sense, and you're hearing CEOs saying this. So Salesforce's CEO, uh, Mark Benioff, has said it, Warren Buffett, the investor, has said it, the Financial Times put an mm. entire cover on this you know it, it capitalism is in dire desperate need of a reset or of reinvention as Rebecca Henderson's just put it um, and, and so suddenly we're talking about systemic change so to your question what do I do about systemic change first thing is just be aware that the small incremental things that we've all been uh, you know focusing on aren't enough that don't stop them but but don't think that that's going don't think that by to pick up the same theme again, you know, buying a Tesla is going to save the world. It yeah. absolutely isn't. Yeah. Um, but you may be part of a systemic shift from the internal combustion engine and fossil fuels to you know electric electrification and so on. Um, I, I just think it's it's find people who are trying to move in the same direction 
and link up. We, none of us can do this as individuals. Mm. Even if we're companies, you know, even the largest companies in the world can't do this on, this, on, on our own. And be resilient, because what's coming at us is going to be, it'll go on for quite a long time, it'll be much harder and much tougher than most of us uh, realize. I'm sounding like I'm a pessimist. I'm not. I'm an, I, you know, I oscillate. But I'm an optimist. And I, I genuinely think that you, the, the old system, the old order, has to die and crumble before the new one can come through. Yes. But isn't it ironic how some of the changes that you and I have witnessed, and, and even somebody in their 40s has yeah. witnessed, particularly in, in the context of China, um, some of it's been going the right way, some of it's been going the wrong way. There was China, relatively an agricultural society, uh, society with most people riding around on bicycles. And then within the course of three or four decades, it's not an, it's an industrial society and everyone's yeah. driving around in cars. Yeah. Um, and, and then in terms of diet, um, in a lot of the, the other parts of the world other than the West, I, I don't want to use some of the, the terms that are used because I find them derogatory, but... But, but it was an agricultural, healthy diet. It was a, you know, a vegetarian diet to, to some extent. Yeah. And now, ironically, a huge swathes of the population, in, whether it's in China or India or elsewhere now, uh, are, are, are now looking at being meat eating, enjoying a hamburger, doing yeah. all of this. Well, fine, we've been doing it. So we've had this glorious party, whatever you want to call it, for many years. And now we're almost implying that they shouldn't be doing the same thing we've been doing because yeah. we now know the consequence. Well, that's a bit rich, isn't it, coming from the people that have enjoyed the party, now yeah. turning those away at the door from coming in. So how do we contextualise all this to be to be fair? Because I, I sometimes feel if I'm talking to my friends in India and in China that I'm just yeah. one big hypocrite. Well, I know I've been, a, as a family, I've been vegetarian for over 40 years. That's not going to save the world. And I, I, I look at I think the... it helps, though. <laughs> well, if you and the... But no, Six billion other people do it, it helps. If, if they did and they won't. Um, and, and therefore, I think if we can encourage people to have more plant-based diets and all the rest of it, and, and you know, veganism among um, younger people, I think it's a very interesting trend. And I, I think we should do everything we can to uh, support that. Uh, but equally, there are issues that come up with that. Do people get enough of the trace elements and so on that they, 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 they need? But I, I, it may be counterintuitive. I, I would never eat synthetic meat, synthetic fish, or whatever. But I think actually synthetic fi fish I might just. Uh, and I've tried, you know, synthetic egg and so on, right. like just foods or and a creek as they used to be. Um, and I think that thrust where you increasingly make uh, animal um, cells, animal protein, and so on, out of plant-based um, raw materials is immensely exciting and yeah. I think over a period of time when you think of it most of the meat people eat is in processed foods of one sort or another it can go out and do mm. things like curry well there's no reason why you need to build up an animal and tear it apart and with everything mm. goes with that the pollution the ethics and the rest of it um, so I, th I think that that sort of um, synthetic biology approach to uh, future diets is immensely exciting but no doubt will take us all sorts of different uncomfortable directions. Yeah, we well, see. Th th this is why I really wanted to bring attention to, to this thing that I've had for decades. It's very, very encouraging. Yeah. And the fact that you put together diet, you put together consumerism, you put together a host of things in here, and reference those people that have been on the trail for a while, I think makes this book a very useful guide. And to almost answer my own question, I asked of you give you some ideas of what can you do about it? Yeah. What might yeah. you do? You know, so you're connected to someone on LinkedIn, you follow someone on LinkedIn, you read what they write, they maybe compliment and read something you've written. But at the end of the day, you think that's just absorption. It doesn't, what is the action it's going to trigger? You know, your yeah, personal change of a behavior or, or what you influence with others. But that's what a good book should do. And I think this might do that. You're, you're very kind. And I, you know, I, I, I would be very pleased to think that that was true. But I, I think educating yourself is an action uh, because you can do all sorts of things as actions. And if they're not well informed, mm. they, they may actually be uh, counterproductive. Uh, but we've not got time. I know people say we've not got time now and therefore we've got to throw everything aside, including education, and just mm. do it. I don't believe that. I think education remains the most serious... Um, 
the most important long-term investment that any society makes. Mm. And, and you said earlier on you hadn't gone to university or anything like that. It doesn't matter. Education has always mm. come in mel- many different yes. forms. Yes, no, it's just channels. a chip on my shoulder, John. That's all it is. <laughs> it's nothing more than that. But when I, no, I, 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 I did yes. go to two universities. I'm a visiting professor at three now. And, and, and yet, I think most of the learning I've done has been way outside those mm. institutions. Mm. And where I was at them, I use them as a springboard to go out and talk to a science fiction author. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm amazed about Chinese science fiction. You used a paragraph from the book because because this really, for me, encapsulated where we are and um, whatever we're going to do. To quote the Beach Boys again, God only knows. Yes. Um, Too often we perceive our political institutions, economic structures, social practices and cultural values as permanent, like the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. Not so. Can you imagine what nation states would be like without three branches of government, asked Dominic Hofstetter. Transportation without cars, commerce without corporations, education without schools. One thing now seems blindingly clear. Many institutional arrangements and structures we take for granted today, like it or not, will be transformed out of recognition tomorrow. And we should welcome the fact. In many ways, John, that single paragraph yeah. captures a- a- everything I- in the book there. And I think it's about being bold and understanding that anything is possible and it should be good things that we make possible. And if, if my own personal life and that of my children, certainly these last few months, you realize that you know you don't have to keep going shopping. Yeah. You don't have to keep driving your car everywhere. That being said, not doing those things has a consequence to other people's jobs. So it's not as simple and as binary as that. But what I think it's shown me, and I think many other people, is anything's possible. If, you know, we really have to choose between risking, you know, an illness and swamping our health system such that it collapses and there's chaos, or staying at home, you know, Initially, I'm sure like a few people, particularly in my age, I was a bit affronted by that. You can't tell me what to do. Then you think, well, actually, you can if it's the benefit of, for the benefit of everybody. And I think through the prism then of climate change now, it's a bit like, OK, if you want to keep doing all those things you've done all, all your life, carry on. But yeah. think about everybody else. You can't just think of yourself anymore. The world leaders can't. Corporation leaders of corporations can't and individual uh, citizens can't. So I, I would just like to say again, w- one more time, I'm very lucky to build an audience on LinkedIn. Mm. I think mostly, almost perhaps entirely, of very um, uh, forward-thinking people, people who are interested in change and want to do something about, whether it's electric cars or, or, or something mm. else. Um, and so it's been my absolute pleasure talking to you. And, you know, I, I hugely recommend people get the book from the library, borrow the book from a friend, whatever it is they do, or if they, if they want to buy a copy. In fact, if they do buy a copy, read it and then share it with other yeah. people. Um, sorry leave to, it in a telephone box somewhere. Yeah, it will, leave, it will reduce the numbers of books you sell, John, <laughs> but I mean, no <laughs> apology for good. doing that. And, um, yeah, I'd just like to say, you know, we're socially distanced across the table here. Um, I'd love to shake your hand and, and thank you, but I'm not going to do that, obviously, on this occasion. <laughs> exactly. So, namaste. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been enlightening. Um, thank I've you so much. I've enjoyed it, Roger. And thank you also for all the work that you do, because I think you shine a spotlight on parts of the world that most people aren't acutely, I mean, remotely aware of. And mm. um, that has huge value over time, because I think we've got to celebrate the new. Uh, as we sort of quietly bury uh, the old. Um, yes, indeed. As we will all be buried one day quietly, of course. Uh, you know, that's fine. Yeah. I've never had anything to do with it.